All right, so good morning. Uh, welcome. I'm Timothy Scott Johnson, currently at Texas A&M Corpus Christi in the Humanities Department. Uh, so the panel today is slightly different, um, but it was based on, uh, initially when I started reading, Steph's new book, Transparency in Post-War France, uh, just out with Stanford, um, that I thought it would be really interesting to get other people's takes on it because it's such a, um, an interesting book with a lot of diverse elements going on. It covers a large uh, amount of terrain. Um, and so I thought, what better way to help me make sense of it than to have a bunch of people coming from different angles to talk about it as well. Um, so it's completely selfish on my part. Uh, and then both Todd and Michael were game, so, uh, so this is great. So before we get going, uh, especially if people haven't had the chance to read the book yet, I wanted to just briefly talk about some of the main themes before introducing um, both Michael and Todd for their individual uh, interventions. So the book provides uh, an interesting way of thinking through many of the central preoccupations of post-war France, um, mainly through the lens of culture, society, and ideas, uh, by focusing on the concept of transparency, which at once is highly general, um, but when you get into the specific context, it has really, um, really specific connotations. And so by looking through this broad frame, it's able to provide really interesting inflection point um, or guiding reference to make sense of a pretty broad constellation of themes. Um, so ranging from, and I'll just list a couple, uh, the legacy of Vichy and the state police procedures. Um, and here I recommend Steph's journal in the uh, modern, essay in the Journal of Modern History. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which covers, I think, pretty much uh, material in two of the chapters of the book. Um, to existential phenomenology, and then uh, existentialist political commitments. Reframing of society's symbolic nature, and structuralist anthropology and Lacanian psychoanalysis. The critique of scientific claims to total objective knowledge. Uh, the advent of cybernetic thinking in the humanities and social sciences. Uh, to the emancipatory aspirations of May 68, and then the anti-totalitarian moment of the 70s and 80s. Um, so I think whatever angle um, you might come to the book with, there's something of interest for just about everybody. Uh, methodologically, it builds off the insights of conceptual history and the study of metaphor, um, charting the changing valences, the concept of transparency, and then particularly against its counter concepts. Um, so transparency versus obstacles, opacity, masks, particularly in uh, the sort of really Rousseauan sense of masks. Uh, and then the various horizons of meaning and expectation they invoke. Uh, so transparency here casts a really wide net across much of the French intellectual life. Um, and then with each successive chapter, we're presented with a new set of problems regarding transparency. So the book unfolds almost in a sort of negative dialectic um, of different ways people are invoking transparency as a problem, and then the other problems that that generates throughout. Um, and so in this way, Steph gives us what he calls a history of the present. Um, so a way of looking beyond our own current discussions of transparency, and then here, problems with the hyper-information age, um, email spying, spying uh, government um, reach into our private lives, all of those things that are all too familiar by giving us ways that the French from the 40s to the 80s uh, thought about pretty much those same sorts of preoccupations. So while much of Western history from the Renaissance to the present, or even going back to uh, Aristotle with the ancient Greeks, has tended to valorize transparency as an ideal for science, self, and society. Um, so you can think here of like uh, Bacon, Descartes, Rousseau. Uh, Steph shows the various ways transparency was raised as a problem from the 40s onward. So it's a problematic in one sense, since the goal of an all-seeing state manifested in pretty unsavory ways under the Vichy regime in post-war bureaucratization and increased police powers during decolonization. Um, but then transparency was also an epistemological problem uh, for the practice and theorization of medical science, anthropology, political theory. Um, so the goal of having absolutely clear knowledge of a subject in the Enlightenment sense becomes an issue that people um, 
start to refuse pretty, uh, pretty roundly. And so in brief, rather than total transparency being something French society and French intellectuals simply objected to as an aim, it was also an unachievable goal. As a result, many different theoretical positions needed to be fundamentally reevaluated. And so if you're familiar with Steph's other work, then you'll recognize the ways this book draws on themes he's already explored, um, French anti-humanist thought in, Western, uh, in the 20th century, the history of science and medicine, uh, particularly pertaining to the writings of Georges Canguilhem and his disciples, uh, film criticism, and then theories of po political sovereignty. So uh, at this point, rather than interrupt the uh, flow of the papers, I just want to briefly introduce uh, all three of the people here. So Michael Berent is Associate Professor of History at Appalachian State University. He frequently comments in English on French politics and on American politics in French, um, appearing both in print and radio. Uh, so while his work deals broadly with French intellectual history in the 19th and 20th centuries, He's been working on uh, Michel Foucault's intellectual development, as well as the careers of his disciples, um, particularly uh, Francois Evald. So most recently, he edited a fantastic forum on the career of Gerald Siegel in modern intellectual history uh, that I recommend. And uh, his article, The Origins of Anti-Liberal Left, the 1979 Vincennes Conference on Neoliberalism just appeared in French politics, culture, uh, and society. So M Michael's paper is titled Patterns, Webs, and Warps, and he'll address the methodological issues in Steph's book. Todd Shepard uh, is the Arthur Lovejoy Professor of History at Johns Hopkins and the co-director of the program in the study of women, gender, and sexuality. He also uh, has published widely on the role of Algerian decolonization, um, especially the role that decolonization plays in modern hexagonal French history. And most recently, he published Sex, France, and the Arab Men, 1962 to 1979, along with a French version that also came out last year, I think. Um, and his paper uh, is going to look at the ways that Algeria, UNESCO, and post-45 France uh, interact. So thinking about Steph's story in terms of questions of national, colonial, transnational, uh, and other uh, analytic frameworks. And then last but not least, Steph will have the chance to respond um, before we open it up for the audience. So Steph is Associate Professor of History and Director of History Graduate Studies at New York University. Aside from the book under discussion this morning, he's also an editor at the Journal of History of Ideas, co-editor of uh, the edited volume Scaffolding of Sovereignty, a translator of two collections of George Congulem's writings, um, and then he's co-authored a number of books with Todd Myers, uh, Experimenta im Individuum, Kurt Goldstein und die Frage des Organismus, uh, and then The Human Body in the Age of Catastrophe, which I think is forthcoming. Yeah. Um, and his first book was An Atheism That Is Not Humanism Emerges in French Thought. Uh, so thank you. And I think Michael. No. Yep. Okay. So it's my pleasure uh, to be here, and, and indeed I was very pleased uh, to, to, to be invited to participate um, in this panel and to have an opportunity to really do a kind of um, sort of oral book review of um, uh, uh, Stephanos' new uh, book. Um, it's a book that I, uh, that I admire greatly. Um, it, it covers, uh, as Scott was saying, a, a really wide swath of French intellectual history. Um, uh, it, it really sort of testifies to great erudition, and I think it's um, an important book uh, on the, the history of, of 20th century um, French intellectual life. Um, it does, however, um, uh, adopt a different methodological perspective than the one that I am used to thinking about and using um, in my own work in intellectual history. So my paper is really going to explore um, the, the methodology used in this book and, and perhaps to, exp, uh, exp, to explore um, uh, some of my reservations about the, the approach that um, it takes. But I'd like to begin, even though Scott has already done this to some, to some extent, to since I'm not sure that everybody in, in the room has necessarily read the book, to kind of give you a, um, a sort of a fairly kind of detailed overview of the book before I uh, specifically take on some of the methodological issues. So to consider the book, um, or to give you an overview of the book, let me say something about what, what, um, what's dealt with in, in each of 
its uh, sections. Um, part one seeks to establish the significance of transparency for intellectual history uh, in general and for 20th century French, uh, France in particular. The results of Gerolanus's brief survey uh, of references to transparency in Western philosophy is his conclusion that, as he puts it, the transparent is a figure of epistemological as much as visual import. Specifically, he says, uh, the transparent was a concept and a metaphor for the presence and materiality of the world to the perceiver. In different ways, this idea, he argues, was the premise of such um, landmark thinkers as Descartes, D'Alembert, and Auguste Comte. It is precisely this nexus between perception and epistemology, between vision and knowledge, that is, in Gerolanus's account, challenged in 20th century French thought. Transparency, if I understand him correctly, became a way of talking about the real, if not always evident, frames that separate the world from the perceiver. And I'm in thinking about the, the appropriate metaphor here to use. Um, I thought of frames, but possibly film, uh, films, lenses, something along those lines. Gerolanus writes that trans transparency as a concept, quote, denotes at times by way of optical metaphors, a concurrent presence and absence, or presence alternating with absence, which allows something to appear across, something that generally does not interfere unless, unless it's self-foregrounded, something that is, that is there but absence itself in a way that it makes itself aware of its presence, something that is not present in the same way as that which it lets appear, end quote. I would propose summarizing this passage, which is admittedly difficult, um, yet crucial to the book's argument, as follows. Um, transparency in, as a concept implies two actions or movements. Um, first, the act of passing through, um, and second, the obstacles that delay or refract this passing through though these obstacles might be what makes that, uh, that which passes through them appear as they are. Once upon a time, transparency meant the former. Um, in the 30s and 40s, it increasingly implied the latter. In other words, the obstacles rather than the passing through. Um, the moral murkiness of the Second World War injected into French culture a new fixation on metaphors of night and darkness that rendered earlier ideas of transparency problematic. But the driving force behind this new way of understanding transparency, i.e. the obstacle rather than the passing through, was the intellectual movement that coalesced around existentialism and phenomenology. Whereas neo-Kantianism had been concerned with demonstrating um, the harmony, the harmonious fit between the material world uh, and consciousness, Sartre and Meloponti in the 30s and 40s became concerned with the opaque resistance of things um, to the human subject. From this standpoint, um, there were fewer greater threats to consciousness than its equation um, with one of the opaque entities in the world, um, a situation Sartre famously defined as bad faith. His example being, you know, when I think that my essence is being, you know, a, co a college professor or a waiter in, in a cafe, whichever, whichever it may be, um, the equation of a, a subjectivity with, with an entity in the world. Um, the only authentic attitude available to the subject in the face of the onslaught of opaque objects for Sartre was sheer negation. Sartre in this way uh, is emblematic of the central role that opacity came to play um, in conceptualizing the relationship between perception and knowledge, um, nowhere in the world in French thought of the 30s and 40s. In part two, Gerolanus turns from the kinds of philosophical and specifically epistemological questions raised by Sartre and his contemporaries to the problem of what he calls social transparency. The epistemological problem of transparency concerned the relationship between perception and knowledge. Similarly, or by analogy, social transparency is concerned with the relationship between state and society. He writes that transparency should not be seen um, simply as a demand for transparent government or justice, but as, quote, um, a conflictual negotiation of the accessibility of resistance of social formations to the state and vice versa, end quote. Um, uh, to be analogous to his claims regarding epistemological transparency, social transparency cannot just mean for Gerolanus uh, a social space um, sort of bereft of obstacles, a space that one passes through. It also means 
highlighting the film or layer that must be passed through. In his account, this film or boundary um, is that between um, society and the state. Social transparency means, therefore, the degree to which society is rendered visible and knowable to the state by virtue of that which, it, which parses it off from the state. Gerolanus explores this theme historically in two ways. First, through an examination of specific ways in which in the immediate post-war years, he thinks the state tried to make society accessible, um, often only to encounter society's resistance. Um, uh, in the relationship between f police forces and distinctive forms of criminality, notably the black market, as well as in the broader concern with dealing with social misfits or inadapté through a range of institutions, such as psych psychiatric hospitals. Secondly, he examines the political thought of post-war Marxists, Merleau-Ponty, Lefebvre, um, showing how even as they believed a transparent society was the only alternative to capitalist obfuscation, they nonetheless abandoned a range of, of concepts premised on the idea of transparency, notably that of history and social space as transparent. Um, so that the Marxist critique became um, about challenging a threatening form of obscurity um, uh, in the name of one that, that was more in keeping with the ideas of human emancipation. In part three, Gerolanus examines a range of issues that in France sprang from the problem of transparency, even if the specific term was not always used explicitly. The idea of the face, um, the idea of norms, and the idea of the symbolic. But I'm going to return to these issues a little bit um, in more detail later in the paper. The final part of the book um, explains the historical course of thinking about transparency in French intellectual life in the 1960s. The ultimate result of this uh, disparate yet consistent preoccupation with transparency was the formulation by French intellectuals of a new conception of modernity. With all uh, the major thinkers of the so-called structuralist movement, Lévi-Strauss, Lacan, Foucault, Derrida, as well as fellow travelers such as Conguilhem or Starobinsky, uh, what they all shared in common was a view that modernity began with and was dominated by the idea of a self-sufficient and self-transparent cogito, a move associated with Descartes. Their goal was to show that, quote, um, the world was not as the moderns had promised, that man did not come to see his own face in the mirror, that communication could not be trusted to carry one meaning, that curing patience was no given, and that, and, the, and that the skepticism that emerged in the early post-war period was morphing into a huge effort to rethink the modern tradition and perhaps heal it um, without repairing its violence." End quote. In addition to diagnosing transparency, they sought to reveal opaque, even obscure spaces through which alternatives to the exclusionary machine of normalization and technological d domination could emerge. The new uh, philosophical outlook found a, a challenge, however, when confronted with the events of May 68. Not only did their ideas about structures and deceptification come face to face, this is again a quote, with a concrete revolutionary agent that pursued real social transformation, but it shifted the register of the conversation about trans transparency from the epistemological ontological to the political. Um, this critique of transparency in this context became primarily associated with political concerns, especially anti-statism. At the same time, a different alternative to transparency emerged. Um, ending transparency in the wake of 68 finally acquired a positive meaning. It meant endorsing complexity and irreducibility, taking up a chance at the liberation of difference and self-division, uh, uh, at the liberation of difference and self-division, meant engagement with the multiplication of this difference. Althusser, de Boer, Clastre, and Foucault all sought ways to liberate individuals and society from subjection to the state. Meanwhile, um, according to Gerolanus, Lefort and his circle, Claude Lefort and his circle came to criticize the idea of a self-transparent society, which they saw as an implicit assumption of Marxist socialism as leading inevitably to totalitarianism. Yet this highly politicized critique of transparency ended, uh, Gerolana suggests, um, not with the bang of emancipated difference, but with the whimper of liberalism, um, which he sees as coming to have dominated French society in the 1980s, not least by championing a new idea of social transparency, symbolized notably by legislation such as Freedom of Information Acts.
Only a few figures from this earlier generation, such as Jean-Francois Lyotard, clung to the earlier idea of calling attention to all that was dangerous um, and violent in the idea of transparency. So once again, I think this is a you know, really sort of compelling well-researched, well-argued um, narrative about 20th century um, French intellectual thought, um, French intellectual life, but I'd, I would like to sort of now uh, offer a few thoughts on, on methodology. Um, the existential dilemma that most intellectual historians grapple with is the question of their relationship to history. That doesn't sound like history um, is the kind of comment they fear and loathe, but what, to which they are commonly confronted. Um, I would like to address in particular the question of the historical character of Gerolanus's book. Um, specifically, I would like to raise a number of issues relating to the problem of context. What role does context play um, as an explanatory framework in the book? And what are some implications of the methodological choices relating to the context um, that he makes, uh, that, uh, the, relating to the context that he emphasizes in the book? In the section of his introduction that addresses methodology, Gerolanus describes his approach as that of semiotic history. The goal of such history, he says, is to pull historically relevant meaning out of the uses of an idea that seemed to mirror, um, that seemed minor on its terms, yet, were, are, yet which are meticulously woven into the fabric of post-war life and thought. In this spirit, he embraces the idea, which he attributes to Wittgenstein, that we should focus on the uses rather than the meaning of words. He proceeds to expand these intuitions into a more comprehensive conception of intellectual history, which he claims uh, it is one of the goals of his book to test drive. He defends what he calls the web as a model of, uh, for conceptual history, which is grounded in Clifford Gertz, Gertz's oft-quoted remark that man is an animal suspended in webs of significance he himself has spun. Girolanus turns this into a model for intellectual history with the following thought experiment. Quote, imagine a web made of strings. At each point where two or more strings intersect, they are tied together into a knot. Sometimes only a couple of strings cross at an intersection point. At other times, there are many, uh, a thicker knot. Some strings begin at one knot and end at the next. Others begin at one knot and go through several others before being tied at the last. As they extend between different knots, strings sometimes get tangled. Many strings uh, allow some leeway. You could pull a string or a threading and watch other strings tighten or move. Um, you could affect a different threading or even break a part of the web." End quote. Concepts are the knots on the web, and to write their history is to address the way they are strung together, pulled, yanked, sometimes in one direction, sometimes in another. Intellectuals are those who engage, create, and give new shape to the web. This intriguing methodological uh, discussion illustrates very lucidly the approach Gerolanus, in fact, takes in the book. The strings are something like the persistent units of meaning that persist over time. Um, individual ideas, words, figures of, of speech. And when I describe them as units, I do so deliberately. There is a bit more similarity between this conception of intellectual history um, and, Ar and Arthur Lovejoy's undeservedly forgotten notion of unit ideas than, than I feel um, Gerolanus is prepared to admit. And I think it, this, we'll see what happens, but we have the, the editor of Arthur uh, Lovejoy's journal. We have the Arthur Lovejoy professor. I bet I'm the only person who has Arthur Lovejoy in his remarks, but we'll, we'll see. Um, so uh, epistemological notions, uh, but I think there is something, I, basic point is, I, I'm, I'm not trying to say it's exactly the same thing, but this, this notion of strings, I think, is actually quite similar to Lovejoy's notion of unit ideas and how they, they, they develop and operate over time. Um, yeah. Well, we can talk more about that if, if necessary. Epistemological notions of knowledge as a kind of light, cultural discourses about criminality as a form of darkness, the state as an institution that oversees society. Each of these, I think, are what Gerolanus calls strings. He traces their contours, particularly interested in moments when they come together to form conceptual knots, such as Merleau-Ponty's idea of ambiguity, Foucault's idea of surveillance as a form of power, Lafour's idea of totalitarianism as a self-transparent society. Tracing the history of these concepts allows him to develop a narrative that is the core of the book's argument. 
the way a debate about transparency in the realm of epistemology develops into a broader philosophical position that then becomes a part of and shapes the political idioms of the late 60s. So far, so good. Yet this method methodology is also founded, and this is, I guess, the point where I'm going to sort of lay out um, the way how I see intellectual history differs from that defended in this book. Um, this methodology is also founded on a rejection or at least a marginalization of a concept that many intellectual historians regard as central, the idea of context. Um, at one point, Gerolano says that he has opted not to pursue what he calls, quote, a contextualist reduction. At another, he says, quote, concepts do not rest among the clouds to be stared at, contextualized, or historicized from the real vantage point of society. End quote. This opposition to, to context rests, rests, I believe, in several arguments. First, as Gerolano says, concepts strung together in a given space have a temporal, temporality and a life of their own. Um, not one not quite attached to specific intel, uh, intellectuals or social political circumstances. Um, this, I would add, is another kind of um, uh, you know, unacknowledged filiation with, with Lovejoy. Um, second, Gerolana seems to suggest that concepts, or perhaps cultural strings, um, often already structure the contexts that are invoked to explain them. Um, he writes more, that more often than not, these concepts structure, clothe, and stage the circumstances and events in manners that historians are, are often eager to ignore. Um, I think Gerolanus means something like this. It's confusing to invoke May 68 as a context, say, for understanding Foucault's or Clastres or Lefort's critique of social transparency, because May 68 was an event that was already um, steeped and shaped by the problem of, of transparency. This idea seems to hark, ba hark back to efforts to formulate a deconstructive approach to intellectual history, which was, um, which, which was commonplace, or at least happened, in the 1980s. Um, in this vein, for instance, uh, Dominic Lecapra criticized what he called a documentary appro approaches to intellectual history, precisely because they, they see texts as needing to be explained by real history. Um, intellectual history, Lecapra argued, needs to remember um, that uh, the relationship can work the other way, that it's not just um, context that shape text, but that text themselves can shape context. Um, it seems to me that Gerolano's suspicion of context is in this vein. His final assumption is that the appeals to context are reductive because they posit a causal relationship between um, context and concept rather than seeing them as consisting of, of different stretches of cultural strings that can intersect, intersect and become knotted together in different configurations. So while I admire the book's erudition and the fascinating story it tells about post-war thought, um, most, of the, most of the aspects um, I find in it that are that I'm less persuaded by, um, I think have to do with its suspicion of the explanatory value of context. Um, I think the problem is that Gerolanus is too inclined to associate context solely with attempts to reduce concepts and ideas to non or not exclusively um, ideational or cultural factors, such as social structures or political movements. Yet the kind of um, contextualism favored by uh, scholars such as those belonging to the Cambridge School um, Quentin Skinner, John Donne, John Pocock, emphasize precisely that the best way to understand context is not as something e exterior um, uh, to text, but precisely as discourse, a set of discursive arguments or rhetorics or patterns of speech that constitutes something like the common assumptions of a particular community existing at a particular period in time. Understood in this way, context does not have, or at least have to have, a reductive or passive function, um, as I believe Gerolanus implies. Understood as, understood as discourse in the Cambridge School sense, um, context is precisely a set of linguistic and conceptual tools that allow those who adopt them to use them. Discursive contexts in, um, in the Cambridge School sense are determinative in some ways, the kind of tool at your dis disposal, after all, places some restrictions on the, on the kind of things you can do with it. But it is also performative. Um, uh, it, it, it implies agency, um, hence the importance of uh, Austin's linguistics um, to the Cambridge School. You can do things with linguistic tools in ways that may, that may in fact, um, uh, alter the tools with which one is operating. 
This is precisely what people like Skinner want to understand um, when they try to relate um, a thinker like Machiavelli um, uh, to the, the context of classical republicanism to arrive at a better understanding of what Machiavelli intended by grasping the constraints weighing down in his thought, but also to understand precisely and to locate precisely the, the exact sort of point of originality um, in his thinking. So I think one of Gerald Onnes's strings could in fact rightly be called the original context for this whole conversation about transparency. I say this without certainty, but it seems to me that the story works like this. The discussion of transparency in the 20th century begins, as I think he very clearly shows, with the ep epistemological discussions that occurred among French existentialists and phenomenologists in the 30s and 40s. This, it strikes me, really is the triggering context, the one that provides the kind of template for the subsequent moments addressed in the book. What makes this discussion distinctive, um, and here I'm both drawing on Gerald Lannis, but also bringing in some of my own thoughts in this, what makes this discussion among the existentialists and phenomenologists in the 30s and 40s distinctive is the way that opacity ceases to be not simply the opposite of vision and knowledge, but constitutive of them. Um, for Sartre and Merleau-Ponty, and I know I'm shamelessly conflating in them and simplifying here, but roughly speaking for them, the fact that my mind um, is part of a body, the fact that I can only ever see from a particular perspective, or the fact that I can never see all the sides of a three-dimensional object at once, are not limitations on knowledge. They are precisely what makes knowledge possible. Um, so things that had seemed as obscure to sort of previous generations of philosophers become constitutive of a notion of the visible and perhaps the transparent um, as well in this particular context. This insight, I think, is tied to an, an epistemology that is rooted in radical finitude. The idealisms that Gerolanus is critical of cling to an idea of a transcendental subject or some equivalent, that is, to a kind of ideal but continuous viewer of the world, to whom the world presents itself as permanently transparent, as permanently available and therefore transparent. French existentialism and phenomenology are premised on the insight that there is no transcendental subject I think that's a general, generally true in, in any case, that our consciousness reveals the world to us, but in a way that can never overcome or cancel out human finitude. And by the way, I'll just say in passing that even though Foucault is kind of one of the subjects, or the, the, the objects in a sense, the, one of the, the topics addressed in this book, Foucault's reflection on this, the, the central place of, of finitude to, to modern thought in the order of things is, is something that I'm drawing on and sort of making this analysis of, of, of phenomenology. And I think, I think Gerald Lannis does as well. Um, this is, I think, what makes trans, tra transparency a problem, a pressing problem at this particular juncture. Transparency comes to mean um, uh, that which is both threatening and authentic and inauthentic, while opacity becomes a mark of authenticity and closely wedded to, the tr to ideas of truth. The existentialist and phenomenological movement strikes me as not just one string um, that can be teased out of a wider and more complex web, but rather as the primary context for the discussion, the context that largely forged the language and ideas in which subsequent iterations of this conversation um, occurred. Very roughly, I would say um, that a model for this approach to transparency, this might seem like a a strange kind of stretch, but can be found in Pocock's approach to classical republicanism in the Machiavellian moment. That is, um, examining the approach one might take is to examine the successive forms a discourse takes in different contexts. The Italian Renaissance, the Civil War in England, and the early American Republic for Pocock. For transparency, existentialism and, ph and ph phenomenological epistemo epistemology in the 30s, the critiques of this ep epistemology in the 60s, and then the reconfigurations of these ideas after 68. The reason I would advocate this approach is because I think it allows one to delimit the topic of transparency um, and uh, the context that triggered discussion of it much more carefully than the alternatives. 
One puzzling feature of Gerald Lanus's book is that despite expressing a kind of skepticism towards contextual approaches and its methodological discussion, it proceeds to resort to a kind of contextual explanation in the book's early chapters when it addresses the issue of why the discussion of transparency is particular to post-war France. The problem, um, uh, I, I found these arguments to be among the, the most strained in an otherwise um, persuasive and admirable book. The problem has precisely to do with the way Gerolanus understands post-war France as a context. Without being a Marxist, his understanding of context recalls the way some Marxists understand ideology as a simple reflection of prevailing social structures at a given time. To admittedly simplify the argument, Gerolanus thinks that there is something dark and shadowy about post-war France that kind of seeps into contemporary French thought. Thus he writes, the cycle of war, occupation, resistance, and collaboration and liberation disrupted standard philosophical categories. They no longer appeared efficient. Um, I'm just not convinced that this is the case um, for the, uh, the material that Gerolanus is addressing. He implicitly acknowledges this on the next page after the quote that I just gave you when he acknowledges that phenomenology's effort to abandon idealism and reach the concrete had begun in the 1930s. Um, hence the point I made uh, earlier. Doesn't this suggest that the triggering context um, is a very specific conversation about transparency and opacity that emerges um, in French thought in the 1930s which to sell, develops a set of terms and concepts that can then subsequently serve as a framework um, for, uh, for discussing um, particular events such as the French experience of the Second World War. Understanding the existentialist moment as a context in this kind of Cambridge School sense, i.e. as a set of discursive condition, conventions, would, I think, not only clarify the way these ideas unfolded over time, but would nip in the bud the temptation to characterize the French experience in World War II as sort of dark and shadowy, which may be true up to a point, but which seems, to over, which seems a little over uh, uh, essentialized. Um, and, um, and to allow him to cling uh, to uh, to this earlier moment, to the, the, the existentialist and phenomenological moment um, as, um, or, or rather, yeah, it, it would prevent him from sort of clinging to an argument about post-war France as the, the most readily available form um, of contextual explanation. So I, in saying this, I think that in a way what I'm sort of in a sense kind of arguing for is the virtue, the narrowing virtues um, of a certain kind of idea of context um, understood in this way um, rather than the sort of more kind of um, expansive approach that um, Gerolanus' methods um, uh, lead him to. Last night my, my colleague and I went to the, um, to the Andy Warhol Museum and there's uh, in, in Pittsburgh, I suggest it, and there's a great quote there um, where uh, Warhol says, um, uh, I don't think um, less is more, I think more is more. I think more is better, you know, and, and maybe that's kind of the difference between us, you know, in this. I'm sort of making an argument in a certain sense for um, less is more, whereas I, I think that for for you know, many interesting reasons, Gerolanus is, is, is more skeptical of that or, or reticent to, to, to go that way. I also think a more robust understanding of context would address another problem um, I see in the book, which is that what I would call its tendency, um, I dub this the tendency to, to metonymic inflation. And I feel entitled to sort of you know, use that language since, since he, he asks for it in a sense um, <laughs> in calling his book uh, one of semiotic history. So I'll bring a little semiotics into it. Um, the way the, and what I mean by that is the way the association, this, this, the tendency of the book to associate transparency with a whole series of related but different concepts, um, which allows him to shift the discussion away from transparency and to focus on other um, issues where the connection between them is, is is, is, in my mind, a little more tenuous than he suggests. These concepts include, among others, the concept of face, normalization, um, and the symbolic. Um, uh, so um, in chapter 12, for example, which is on the norm and the same, Gerolanus con connects transparency and the idea of norms by saying that transparency is th the presupposition that makes norms um, and their uh, imposition on others possible. 
Maybe. Um, but I just don't think that the subsequent discussion of normality and normativity, which focuses on social, sociological discussions of normality from the 30s um, on, and then on Conquilem's thought, bears out in any kind of rigorous way that this conversation is fundamentally one about transparency, um, even in the sense of being one of the strings bound up with others in a conceptual knot. Um, the historian here is positing an assumption, i.e. that normativity assumes transparency, that is plausible um, um, and um, that he builds his argument on without um, necessarily sort of um, a, a carefully identifying this connection in contemporary discourse, at least as I read it. Um, once again, a clearer sense of what the triggering context of this discussion is might have reined in some of these explanatory um, sort of elaborations of the book's key term, or at least made the relationship to one another clearer. Finally, and this is my final point, one feature of this book that is both intriguing and problematic is the way in which transparency is presented not simply as one interesting theme among others in French intellectual history, but in a sense as the or at least a crucial concept to understanding French contemporary thought as such. This is a fair enough argument to make, um, and in this sense it does recall, um, as Gerolanus acknowledges, Martin Jay's similar, studies, similar study from several decades ago, Downcast Eyes. Um, but the problem is that by building a historical narrative around the critique of post um, uh, uh, around the critique of transparency, the book, the book becomes, not always unwittingly, a triumphalist account of the rise of, a, of the generation of French thought associated with Foucault, Derrida, Lacan, and Althusser, among others. It requires him to characterize earlier periods as um, benighted, although given the way the book's metaphorical system works, I should perhaps say illuminated, um, uh, as they have not yet incorporated the critique of transparency. Um, Gerolanus refers in the context of a discussion of Merleau-Ponty, quote, to the pre-war premise of natural attitude, transparency, self-evidence, and confidence about a, f um, a better future. Um, but as a characterization of European culture in the 1920s and 1930s, this claim seems stretched, um, somewhat stretched. The, the French thinkers uh, that are treated in this book are described as having founded um, he uses this term on several occasions, a new enlightenment, showing Cartesian modernity as uh, obsolete, hopeless, and destructive, um, as they reveal the violence of transparency and the opaque, even obscure speeches through which alternatives to the exclusionary machine of normativization and technological domination could emerge. The story does present itself to a significant degree as one of how a group of French thinkers overcame the simplistic and oppressive ideas of an earlier generation and at long last got transparency right. Paradoxically, I think, Gerolanus has written um, what you might call a Whiggish history of postmodernism. Um, so uh, those are attempts then to sort of lay out some of the ways in which um, my own sort of tastes, I suppose you could say, in intellectual history differ from um, this book. Um, and I look forward to, to the discussion. But you know, once again, I, I think that this, this really is um, a, a, a powerful and compelling um, account of um, an, a, a French intellectual life in the post-war period, one from which we can all learn a great deal. I think it'll become um, a work of reference. So if you haven't read it, I encourage you to do so. And I look forward to our discussion. Thank you.